Welcome to Apologetics from the Attic, the show that seeks to teach and defend the Christian faith in a post-Christian culture. And now, broadcasting from an attic in an undisclosed location somewhere outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, here is your host, Dave Lewis. Hey everyone, welcome, welcome to another episode of Apologetics from the Attic Reminder. You can get the audio version of this if you found me on YouTube, on iTunes, Spotify, and all the other places that you can uh, get your podcasts, and also newcanbiblerebinding.com. Uh, for all your Bible rebinding needs. And let's jump right back in. We're going to continue our study of systematic theology, and we're using as our text the Beaky Smalley Reformed Systematic Theology text. And today we're going to start on chapter two, I believe. What is theology? Part two. And this is an interesting chapter. Let's just jump right in for sake of time. I have some places to be, so I want to get this recording in. And we're in our analytical outline. Let's take a look at where we are so far. And like I said, these analytical outlines don't underestimate their importance because it helps you organize how you look at the text. So last episode on our systematic theology, we looked at the branches of theology there, point B, numbers 1 through 8. And then um, we are talking, we are on point C now. We are on page 52, I believe. Um, that's where we are. No, we're, we're on page 55. We're on page 55. We did do that final part. And what is theology part two? Now, this is interesting. I'll probably title this episode, um, you know, who does theology, the academic or the um, lay person, regular church person, you know, so to speak, uh, for lack of a better term. Uh, that's part of the discussion they have here. So let's just jump right in. Um, so the subtitle of this is a, it's Theology is a Spiritual Discipline. And we're going to see the distinction between being a spiritual discipline and an academic task. And the point that Beaky and Smalley make here, which I totally agree with, is we tend to gravitate toward one pole or, uh, pole or another. And it seems like it's just human nature to think that the study of theology is either this super important academic discipline that only the academics can do, and you have professional people. PhDs. And then the other extreme would be to say theology isn't important. You just need to have a spirituality and have an experience with God, practically be a moral good person. And, you know, whether you have this academic grasp of systematic theology and the teachings of the Bible or not, doesn't matter. Well, we want to bring those things together. Okay, so we begin. And if you're listening, um, I have the text on the book cam here on YouTube if you like to follow along. Uh, some people like the visual. Uh, academic education, I begin reading here. Academic education has great value, but a love for academics for their own sake can destroy your soul. First sentence of this chapter. Uh, absolutely true. Uh, it's called Ivory Tower Syndrome. Um, it's the desire to say something novel or new. Uh, in many seminaries across our land, uh, if you want to get a PhD, you have to find some new cutting edge theory of something instead of just going retreading the tried and true topics of old truths, right? Um, and then he quotes 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman who needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The calling of a theologian demands diligence and labor in order to properly interpret and apply God's word. However, the academic work of theology must aim at the high goal of pleasing God. So see, those, there's the two uh, things they're putting next to each other. The academic uh, labor and diligence to properly understand and apply God's word. But what's the goal of that? To just have intellectual knowledge? No, it's to please God. Okay. And... This text, and this text has always stood out to me. I remember John Piper uh, did a, when he was walking through Romans, 
Uh, and let's go to uh, let's go to, to accordance because I want to look up this text. Well, let's read let's read from the text verse here. When Christ taught in Jerusalem, the Jews marveled at his teachings because Jesus had not been educated in the rabbinic schools. So, and this is John chapter seven. The Lord replied, "My doctrine is not mine, but his his that sent me. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself." He that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory, but he that seeketh his glory that sent him, that same is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. So how, so this is Jesus coming against the idea, uh, because the, the Pharisees are approaching him saying, where did you get this learning? Where did you get this knowledge? You haven't been educated, formally educated at our schools. And, um, he shall know, how do you know the doctrine of Christ is true? Um, you desire to do his will. So seeking to please God confirms that the doctrine you have is true, according to Jesus. So God, as, as they say, God the Son came with supernatural revelation from God the Father. No man can discover these truths by rational deduction or empirical observation. God must reveal them through Christ. Therefore, the work of learning true theology is more than an intellectual enterprise. It requires faith in Christ, submission to God's will, and pursuit of God's glory. So, very important, very powerful. Okay, so they're, they're, they're really solidly coming against this idea that systematic theology is just an academic task. And what are, what's their goal in this chapter? We will take a closer look at the nature of theology, especially its spiritual nature, as the effect of or a believing response to gospel revelation. We begin by returning to our definition, okay? So now we have a more focused and extensive definition of theology. So last time... Um, or maybe two episodes ago, uh, we, we went over their basic definition of theology, and now they are going to uh, refine it more and, and dig deeper into it. Um, we, their previous definition was the study of God and his relationship to the world, especially his relationship with human beings. The aim of theology should be a right relationship with God through the mediation of Christ. So that's very important, right? It's not, it's not just a right relationship with God generically or in general. We believe that the only way to be properly related to the creator of the universe is through Jesus Christ, the historical person, not just some Christ concept, but the actual historical person, right? And then the Apostle Paul, they quote Philippians 3, 7, 8, incredible text, Philippians 3 is one of my favorite chapters of the Bible. Uh, Paul says, but what things were gained to me, talking about his religious privileges and attainments as a Pharisee, these I count loss for Christ, yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of knowledge of Jesus Christ my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and also I do count them but dung that I may win Christ. And then he goes on, not in the text here, but to be found in him, not having my own righteous comes by the law, but the righteous that comes by faith, faith in Christ Jesus. Um, the righteous that comes from God and is by faith. Um, and then they quote Augustine here. Augustine said that the true objects of our happiness are, quote, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, who are at the same time the Trinity, one being supreme above all. We rest with satisfaction only by knowing, trusting, loving, and living in God for his own sake. All other things are means to be used to gain God. Here, read yourself some Augustine, man. I'm, I'm part of my... Um, next to my table I you know I'll try to keep well sometimes my wife gets mad at me because I'll stack up 20 books on my end table in the living room but I've been doing good with it I only have like one or two there right now I do have Augustine City of God sitting there and while I'm drinking my coffee early in the morning I'll try to read a paragraph or two or just one section powerful stuff um, and then like I said these guys the bibliography here and the quotes like William Ames a very good Puritan writer uh, he said theology is the doctrine of living to God, right? Ames explained the phrase, men live to God when they live in accord with the will of God, to the glory of God, and with God working in them. Thus, theology aims at the fulfillment of man's great created purpose, to glorify God and enjoy him forever. 
uh, the Westminster Shorter Catechism answer to question one. Um, what's the chief end of man to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And then we have Jonathan Edwards mentioned noted that some theologians such as Petrus van Maastricht, that's a newer one that they just started released his stuff. I think recently I got one volume. Um, he slightly expanded Ames definition, the doctrine of living to God by Christ. Okay. And they're saying how excellent this is, uh, as a divine revelation of theology, doctrine, its object, God, its mediatorial character by Christ and its aim living to God. Uh, yeah, I circled that. So theology is doctrine. Its object is God. Its mediatorial character is by Christ and its aim is living to God. And then they make this point, important point. Though we study theology as sons and daughters of Adam, we do not do it as pure as Adam did in the garden, but as fallen sinners in need of salvation and restoration. Let me pause right there. Um, and I think that um, Thomas Boston in his fourfold state, um, that book, he does a really good job. And then, um, um, oh, why am I blanking on his name? This is, uh, my brain needs to jumpstart here, work brain. Um, Herb Herman um, Hoxima. In his dogmatic theology, oh man, he's got such a great section on Adam's understanding of God before the fall. Adam wasn't some primitive ape-like person who had no knowledge. Adam could perceive the nature of God more clearly through a blade of grass in his unfallen state than we can through the entire divine revelation of scripture. He, he, before the fall, nature itself in an unmediated, undiluted way revealed the glory and character of God to Adam and Eve. Um, oh, oh, what a glorious thing. But now as fallen sinners, we are in need of salvation and restoration. And that's how we do theology now. That's how we meditate on God as sinners, no longer as uh, unfallen. So what does that mean? What, what's the implications of doing theology as a sinner? They say, therefore, theology is a study of God with a view toward the reconciliation of God and sinners through Christ. Okay, and then he quotes 2 Timothy 3.15. And then John Owen just keeps giving the references for who to read. He wrote this, evangelical, evangelical theology has been instituted by God in order that sinners may once again enjoy communion with God himself the all holy one. The ultimate end of true theology is the celebration of the praise of God and his glory and grace and the eternal salvation of sinners. Furthermore, as those alienated from God by sin, we can do theology only by the light of his gracious revelation. And they quote Johannes Polyander, 1568 to 1646. Uh, let's let's read this quote. So they're just going through definitions of theology that have been given by past theologians. Quote, we define theology as the knowledge or wisdom of the divine matters that God has revealed to people in this world through ministers of his word, inspired by the prophetic spirit, and that he has adapted to their capability to lead them to knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness and renders them wise into their own salvation and God's eternal glory. Unquote. A similar but shorter definition was given by Johannes Wollebius, 1586, 1629, quote, Christian theology is the divine, or the doctrine concerning God, as he is known and worshiped for in his glory and for our salvation. Okay, so then they give the summary paragraph, which I thought was really good. In summary, we may define theology as the authoritative knowledge and wisdom revealed in God's word concerning God, so that we may joyfully live unto him through Jesus Christ. Okay. And it's authoritative because it stands on the word of God. It's knowledge and wisdom because it informs the mind, which certain truths and directs life. It pertains to God, not in the narrow sense of doctrines of God, but broadly regarding God's nature, will, and works. It aims at producing a God-centered life. Do you ever thought of theology that way? Because, you know, many people think that it's it prevents having a god-centered life because you just get caught up in doctrine and it's just all head knowledge uh, but that's just not the case it's just not the case now is there a danger in that in the academic practice only absolutely okay so now we move into this interesting topic here the classification of theology is it science or is it wisdom okay 
So what what is what does that mean? What what is it? And it it's a there's a long standing debate. Um. So what's the part of the diff? And they're right about this. How do you define science? So that's part of the. So it's either science or wisdom. Well, what is science? Okay. Now, um, we're not saying, and let me read them. In this context, science is not the study of natural phenomena and physical laws that manifest effects that can be measured and rest and tested in a laboratory, but it is knowledge, Latin scientia, that is the recognition of perception that what is what is real or true. As an academic field, theology is called a science because it is the disciplined pursuit and communication of knowledge by a community of scholars. Okay, so that's why it's, so, and it used to be called the mother of the sciences, the, the queen of the sciences. Uh, you know, it was very prestigious to have a theology degree back in the day. No longer. You know, all major scientists who dis made great breakthrough discoveries before the modern period of the Enlightenment were all Christians, and even after the Enlightenment. And they all believed that what they were studying was the creation of God. So it was inherently theological. Okay. And now they move on to, so that's, so, so they're arguing that as an academic field, theology is a science because it's the disciplined pursuit and then communication of that knowledge that is pursued among a community of scholars. But in the Bible, knowledge and wisdom are used in parallel with each other. Okay. Whether the technical skill of a trade or the ability to live a godly and blessed life. 1 Corinthians 12, 8, you can know many things without perceiving the real value or their usefulness. It seems best to say that in biblical usage, wisdom refers to skill or competency, sometimes in a specific trade or field, but more generally in one's whole approach to life. Knowledge refers to an accurate perception and faithful recognition of some reality. Biblical wisdom includes knowledge. But it is broader than knowledge, encompassing the holistic ability to live skillfully and joyfully for the glory of God. Okay, so you hear about this, right? People can have a lot of knowledge, but do they really have wisdom? And, you know, how I've heard it explained, kind of like what they just said, is wisdom is the experience of applying the knowledge you have to actual real life and situations. Many people know a ton of stuff, but if you ask them to apply it in real life, they're toast, where you want someone who has wisdom, meaning, yes, I learned all these things when I was younger, but then I know what happens when you apply them, and here's what I've learned. Um, and then it kind of is like a feedback loop, right? And then that informs, okay, maybe I didn't really know what I thought I knew back then, right? Um, what's Augustine say about knowledge and wisdom? Augustine distinguished wisdom as pertaining to the contemplation of eternal, invisible realities, and knowledge as pertaining to the understanding of historical, visible events that involve human actions. Okay, so that's interesting. So for Augustine, wisdom is to contemplate eternal, invisible realities. Thus, theology especially pertains to wisdom, according to Augustine. Um, they both have a part to play in theology because eternal, the eternal son of God entered human history in the incarnation, a historical visible event. However, medieval and later reformed Orthodox theology, drawing upon distinctions made by Greek philosopher Aristotle and elucidated by Thomas Aquinas, said that wisdom is a knowledge of first principles, particularly a knowledge of the good and the true. And knowledge or science is a knowledge acquired by demonstration and resting on self-evident first principles. Okay, so that's now where you get uh, more toward uh, the modern understanding. So it seems best to consider theology to involve both science and wisdom with its heaviest accent on wisdom. Uh, Augustine said, this doctrine is wisdom above all human wisdom. Sacred doctrine is especially called wisdom. Okay. So, you know, this might seem like a pedantic little, what, what's the point of this section? But um, is, here's where this applies in modern days. For many in the American church, understanding theology is not in any real sense a scientific endeavor where we seek to understand these first principles, have a group of scholars who are experts in the research they do, and they communicate it to us 
And that is how we come to a revelation of who God is. And that's how we contemplate God. And that's how we come to understand who God is. It's, it's not that. It's experiential mainly. It's going to a uh, you know church service and having emotional experience and having feelings. And that's how I experience theology. And we need to come out of that. It's created a very weak church that just gets caught up in emotionalism rather than being able to seriously think through the issues of our day and apply divine truths um, distilled from the scriptures, systematic theology, to contemporary issues. Okay? Um, so that's why this is an important section. Because do we really have Christian leaders who have national spotlight who put out wisdom and put out carefully researched and reasoned from their study of scripture and their living out a life of holiness, do we have them speaking into the important issues of America? Yeah, yeah of course they're out there, but they're few and far between. Um, if you want someone to follow with a quick, easy podcast, I would recommend Albert Moeller in The Briefing, who is a man who is formally trained in systematic theology and also has the wisdom to apply that Christian worldview that comes from Scripture to current events. Albert Moeller, The Briefing. Uh, I, would, I would highly recommend if you want an example of that, because Albert Moeller is not the type of person who's going to suit to agree and say, well, you know, the idea of systematic theology and, and careful study of the Bible is not necessary for any of this. He would say it's absolutely indispensable for it. If you don't have someone who has thought through these issues biblically and done what we've talked about here, exegetical theology, systematic theology, biblical theology, ethical theology, um, philosophical theology, the, all the things we studied before and all the topics, um, they hardly are going to be able to speak in a coherent and, uh, you know, Christian way into the issues facing our culture today. Um, we have Paul Leander. Let's get a quote from him. Uh, theology contemplates, uh, hold on. He says, um, the Bible calls it knowledge and it involves a knowledge of divine things that is a definite recognition fixed very deeply within the mind by the clearest shows of proof. Um, theology contemplates the unfathomable mysteries of God and functions as an architectonic standard that guides all the disciplines and is the final judge of all actions and thoughts outshines all of the other science. Sciences. Interesting. So the, the high view of theology, contemplating who God is, the mysteries of God, that is the ultimate standard of all knowledge, according to these individuals. We've really lost that in our society, haven't we? I mean, what, what God, who God is and what the scriptures say is, is never mentioned in public discourse by politicians, for example, very rarely, very rarely. Owen favored the idea that theology is spiritual wisdom, for it, quote, has the unique property of making men wise in the mysteries of the gospel by virtue of union with Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Okay. So, and they go on. Let's see if there's anything else I thought was good here. Okay, here's when I star something, that's my little uh, sign that this is the, a good wrap up quote. Um, in summary, theology is the divine knowledge and wisdom by which we serve God. We return to Ames' definition. Theology is the doctrine or teaching of the living God. Ames explains it is called doctrine, not to separate it from understanding, knowledge, wisdom, art, or prudence, for these go with every exact discipline, most of all with theology, but to mark it as a discipline which derives not from nature and human inquiry like others, but from divine revelation and appointments. So that's very important, right? Where do we get our ultimate authority as fallen sinners? of who God is and what he does. And it's the scripture alone, the sufficiency of scripture to communicate these things. Right. And then we have here next uh, section, the orientation of theology. Is it theoretical or practical? Okay. So this is related to the wisdom and knowledge question or whether it's a science or not. Um, so this is another dichotomy. 
that sometimes comes about where, you know, you'll, you'll hear, you, this is the type of quote you'll hear sometimes in churches. Uh, even pastors will get behind the pulpit and say it. You know, we don't do these fancy doctrinal terms in our church. We just love Jesus. You know, we don't get into that. That, that breeds arrogance and pride. Uh, we're not just sitting in our ivory towers studying things. We, we get out there and we, we actually do things for the kingdom, right? We're very practical in our church. Okay, well, that's I agree. Um, but that can be, that's, I think, a, an extreme that's out there quite a bit. And the other extreme would be what? Well, this person doesn't interact with anybody and just is an academic who reads books all day and writes papers for journals that pretty much nobody reads except people in his own circle. Um, and, and we're just co contemplating things. That's not it either. Okay. Is theology contemplation alone or is it in its very nature and by itself goes forth into practice? As this, uh, that's a quote from Turretin, Francis Turretin, another very important theologian to, to know about. Theology is both theoretical and practical. Though its focus upon knowing God and his works, it is thus more theoretical. If theology were merely theoretical, then it would be cut off from daily life. On the other hand, if theology were merely practical, then we would throw away more abstract but crucial doctrines such as the Trinity, and predestination. Therefore, theology must involve knowledge. Now here's, they make the same point I was just making a moment ago. In the contemporary evangelical church, too many Christians think that we must choose between dead orthodoxy and anti-intellectual activism or moralism, right? So these people who just talk about doctrine all the time, that's just dead orthodoxy. That's the frozen chosen, those Calvinist frozen chosen people. Um, and then you look at a lot of these places that, uh, you know, the mainline churches, there's many of them who, you know, put a lot of money into social work and social services and soup kitchens and homeless ministries and stuff like this, which is great, but they are totally heretical when it comes to key historic biblical doctrines. So does it have to be that way? Well, I hope it doesn't. I hope we can have robust, solid, according to scripture, biblical teaching that is solid, historic, as we talked about before, but also leads to fruit, right? Christians should be activists. They should be out there promoting biblical morality and be a light to the world, as Jesus says, salt and light. Then he gives this quote from David Clark. Uh, I'm not sure who David Clark is. Uh, I'm not sure if he's a modern guy or a, or a more Reformation guy, but a uh, quote, he observes, or no, 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 that was his observation before. I starred this one. As a result, Christians zealously pursue holiness, evangelism, social and political causes and missions, and yet are disengaged from or suspicious of intellectual reflection, abandoning the academy to the wicked and unbelieving. So I've said this before and I'll say it again. Churches should have Christian education for their adult members, also the children, of course, but the adult members of the church who attend should have access for free the same level of academic teaching that goes on at Bible colleges or seminaries. Well, how can a pastor do that? Well, that should be a pastor's job if they're getting paid full time, 40 plus hours a week, to prepare high level, seminary level, and yes, I do I am on the side that I think pastors should go to seminary, be trained in seminary to be pastors. I'm not for, now listen, God, God does whatever he wants. I'm not going to judge another man of what God's calling is in their life. And I'm not going to look down on them if they don't have education, but I'm telling you, I think the standard should be a biblical education, which would equip you then to prepare high academic level teaching for the congregation. So the congregation is, is being, is being taught and is as well informed, just like, uh, you know, Bible college students and seminary students are being informed by their professors. The pastor should be informing their people in the same manner. 
and educating them the same manner. That, that's just me. You should have your congregation reading through some type of higher level academic systematic theology type topic or book in a Sunday school class, right? And, and how many churches do Sunday school anymore? Like adult education. Like I remember being at this Assembly of God meeting with probably 50 to 75 pastors represented, 50 to 75 churches is a pretty decent gathering. And one of the speakers got up and asked for a show of hands, how many of you still do Sunday school, meaning a formal classroom style, you know, teaching between the services, after the services, before the worship services, like two or three people raised their hand. It was quite striking. Why, why isn't that done anymore? I mean, it just shows you the value of it in a lot of people's mind. It's just, there's no value to it anymore. We, we don't have time, right? Sadly, so many pastors actually are just running a business. It's like, it's, it's like that's their, that most of their tasks that take up their 40 hours of their week is, is like a CEO running a corporation and making sure the staffing is this and the, the, the future and the finances and the vision and the thing and then this and all these pieces are moving together rather than sitting down and spending that 40 hours a week shepherding, pastoring, preparing these messages to feed the sheep, right? So they don't really feed the sheep. Okay, so anyway, okay, I'm off my, I go on my soapboxes, I know. Um, so this, so, so it's both. I mean, we, we, it's, it's, if we sever theological contemplation, listen, this, this is good. If we sever theological contemplation from practical action, which is, which is what a lot of churches are doing. Um, the, the measure of a church is the practical action it's taking and all the ministries it has going on, all the outreach it's doing, but very little solid Christian education. Let me jump back on my soapbox a little bit longer. Um, it drives me off the wall. And look, I'm not judging anybody. Listen, it's between you and God, but I'm just giving my opinion. It drives me off the wall. When I watch pastors, instead of preparing uh, material themselves to provide their congregation in midweek Bible studies, if they even have them, Instead, they just purchase pre-packaged curriculums and they have home groups or Bible study groups run by people who don't have any theological training and they think to make up for that. Oh, here's a DVD and here's a workbook. Just play this 30 minute DVD and, ha and go over the questions as if that's going to replace solid biblical systematic theological teaching of your people. It's not. I'm sorry, it's not. Okay, off the soapbox. Now, we don't want to, if we do, what happens when you sever theological contemplation from practical action? Then we destroy the church's ability to develop the breadth and depth of wisdom necessary to glorify God in all of its life and work. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, then we have a paragraph about, they quote Jeremiah 9. Let not the wise man, 9, 20 through 24, great verse, right? Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, and that I am the Lord, which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. Mm. That's a great, that's a great one. But then they point out, in Jeremiah 10, 1 to 16, however, theology is a kind of knowledge that demands action. Knowing God moves us to glorify him. Who would not fear thee, O king of the nations, for to thee doth it appertain. Okay, another soapbox. Let me jump on it. Modern worship songs versus ancient hymns. Or even reform, and not even ancient. I mean, there's hymns from the 1800s and early 1900s that are better. Um when you just sing the same chorus and catch line over and over again, and it's theologically anemic, look at the hymns, four, five, six verses that talk about theology, who God is and what he's done. And that moves us to worship. And many times we just replace it with things that will stir on the emotions, rock concert style with the lights dimmed and the music played correctly. Same feelings, by the way, you can get at a secular rock concert. But we call it the Holy Spirit and we call it, oh, we're really worshiping God. When people leave, oh, wasn't that worship so good today? 
What they don't, a lot of times what they don't mean is, oh man, I was able to contemplate, wait, wait, wait. Um, I was able to contemplate God today, right? I was able to glor, I, I was moved to glorify God today based on what I learned about who God is and what he's done. A lot of times it's just emotion, right? Turton said that, quote, the knowledge and worship of God are connected together and separately, as in the sun, light, and heat can never be separated from each other. Great analogy, right? So the knowledge of God and the worship of God are inseparably connected. You can't separate the light and heat from the sun, right? The sun produces both light and heat, and you cannot separate the two. So many times is our worship of God lacking because we don't have the knowledge of God to go along with it. I, I think so. So neither can that, know, can that knowledge of God be true unless attended by practice. John 13, 17, 1 John 2, 5. Nor can that practice be right and saving, which is not directed by knowledge. So see, it's both and. So you can have all kinds of practice, but not have knowledge, right? The liberal mainline churches are filled with that. All kinds of people who practice things in the evangelical church too. Let's not pick on the liberals. All kinds of knowledge or all kinds of works, but do they have the knowledge? And then the other extreme, which is out there too. You got people who are very prideful in their understanding of reformed theology. I know reformed theology, but they don't do a lick of good in the community. Right, the, the practical caring for the poor and needy, you know, like helping people with practical needs in their lives. They don't do that. They just go around and tell people, "Do you know the gospel?" and they and they beat them with intellectual knowledge, um, instead of reaching out in love and using that as a mechanism for people to come to know who God is. Right. Van Maastricht said that Christian theology is not theoretical only, nor practical only, but unites theory with practice and is a knowledge of the truth, which is according to godliness, Titus 1.1, right? It's both theoretical and practical because theology orients us toward God. So basically the whole point is, and they're making, a, 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 what, what's the point of this? So this thick book we are looking at, which is 1,100 pages for just volume one, and there's three more volumes, there's four volumes, probably like, uh, you know, 4,500 4, pages, 4,500 pages. What's the point of this? Well, the more we come to know who God is by studying the scriptures, the more that our lives will become godly, right? Many people don't believe that. Um, belief leads to behavior. Uh, many, many, many situations where people are struggling with life controlling issues and addictions and depression and anxiety and fears are because of a lack of knowledge of who God is and what he's done. It really is. Um, Let's, let's read some Aquinas real quick. Aquinas says, theology is taught by God, teaches of God, and leads to God. God. Uh, here's a star quote. Polyander said, theology consists not of bare and empty theory, but of a practical science that powerfully stirs the human will and all the emotions of the heart to worship God and to cherish one's neighbor. So what's the result? Um, and th this should give us a desire to study these things. Many things that have been pushed to the side because they're not pragmatic. They don't lead to church growth. They don't get you a church of three, five hundred, a thousand, fifteen hundred. Okay, you know, to have a church of seventy-five to hundred people, and that's all you have for years on end. But those seventy-five to hundred people really know the scriptures, right? No, we we need to just do things that just continue to make growth, growth, growth. And I'm telling you, teaching theology. And making that a benchmark of your shepherding will not grow you a giant church. But it will draw in the people who are hungry for the real deal. Because a lot of people show up at churches because the church is giving out a bunch of fluff. A bunch of emotion. You know, anyway, a bunch of entertainment. And then Jesus caps it off, John 17, 3. This is life eternal. 
that they may know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. So we're 40 minutes in for sake of time. There's no way I can do this section justice, but this is a cool section because the pre-modern development of systematic theology. So they go through historically, right? Starting with like the apostles creed and going through uh, you know, early church fathers, and then they go into the medieval period, and then they go into the Reformation period and really just show, uh, you know, this, this first starting of systematic theology starting to be done in history, right? So we'll, we'll go through that next time. Um, and then they talk about how rationalism, the enlightenment, emotionalism, romanticism, uh, how that really made inroads into uh you know systematic theology and what that how that but it's it the, why does the church do this systematic theology and then finally this this section the loci of systematic theology meaning how do you organize the topics of systematic theology and they go through a little bit of history on that and then they actually give uh the loci of systematic theology right uh prolegomena Theology proper, anthropology, Christology, pneumatology, soteriology, ecclesiology, eschatology, right? So we'll go over all of that next time. We'll, we'll really break down what are these loci? What does it mean to even be a loci? I'm assuming that people that find this don't know anything about anything. So it's trying to make it very basic. Um, and, and so now we're starting to really get into some meat of how do we organize systematic theology? And then... I like this too. And I love the systematic theology, man. It's just, this is a new one too, by the way. So this is a, uh, not the new is better, but I think this is going to end up being in the next, uh, you know, people are going to look back the next 15, 20 years, and this is going to be an authoritative, uh, systematic theology that is, that is referred to by people in use. But anyway, who does theology where and when, right? Who does it? Where do they do it? When do they do it? And, and the way they break this down. Uh, just to give you a taste, so because I got to get out of here. Um, we're going to the analytical outline here because um, it's it's really good. Um, of oh, the low psi, this next part. Look how it's broken down. It's really cool. Who does theology? The creatures of God who are an image of God, who are sinners against God, who are regenerated children of God, pastors and teachers given and sent by God. That's who does theology. Where do we do theology? Among fallen mankind in the church. When do we do theology? During our pilgrimage to glory and during the last days. Which theology do we do? This is in this part. Christian theology, Catholic theology, evangelical theology, and then reformed theology. And then they get into... Uh, what is reformed theology? Oh man, that is such good stuff. God centered covenant. Oh my gosh. And then they go over the five points of Calvinism. All right. We're, we're, wait till we get to that part. I mean, some of the stuff might be boring to you, but we're, we're setting up to get into some real meaty stuff. Remember reformed systematic theology, Joel R. Beakey, Paul M. Smalley. Um, I saw that Reformation Heritage books, reformationheritage.com. I'm getting no royalties from them. They're selling this four volume set for 120 bucks. You can get this giant, like five, 6,000 pages of systematic theology for only $120. Um, if you need a systematic theology book and you're on a budget or a set and you can't afford all the, the you know, all of them, this is a good, just four volume set, 120 bucks. Can't beat it. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us for another edition of Paul Jacks from the Attics. Like, subscribe, share. Um, we'll continue our study of the Book of Romans next time and continue our journey through systematic theology. Please message me uh, on YouTube, on the YouTube video, if you have any uh, topics or ideas uh, that you'd like me to cover, anything you'd like me to review, and I'd be happy to consider doing it for a future program. So thank you, everyone. I appreciate it. And God bless to you all. Amen. See you next time.